All right. Hi, everyone. John Harris here, managing partner with Fortune Management. Uh, quick disclosure or disclaimer before we get started here. If you like the content that we share um, either on the 21st Century Dentistry podcast or the Real Dental podcast, I would greatly appreciate your support by simply uh, liking the channel um, and clicking the bell notification so that you get updates anytime that we launch new episodes. I uh, got a really interesting one coming out next week with Mr. Mark Murphy of Northeast Sequoia. Um, uh, financial advisory firm um, talking about his most recent book, Extraordinary Wealth. And then he's actually got a new book coming out. So I'm really excited to talk to him about that one. Uh, but uh, welcome back. Um, and with me today, I have Mr. Sam Douthit, Jocelyn Jeffries, and Carrie Cahill, the Cahill. Um, and we're going to be talking about a few different subjects today. It's It seems as though this has come up fairly often uh, with multiple clients. But um, when you're looking at just the, the trend in the direction, that the industry's in and the progress that DSOs have made. And there's actually some updates as far as that's concerned. Uh, that I think would be interesting to discuss, but um, multiple practice ownership, large group practice ownership, creating passive streams of income uh, through associates and minority partners um, in an effort to, I would imagine the goal for most people is uh, simply work-life balance. You know, if I can build an enterprise that's not so dependent upon my ability and availability to turn a handpiece, um, then that's less liability for me. Because obviously, if something happens and I get injured and, you know, and I, I can't produce, um, then that's a major asset to the practice that now has been dampened significantly. So, um, leveraging associates, multiple partners, minority partners, own, minority partnerships. Um, and then also multiple locations, um, forming passive streams of income and enhancing our ability to, um, or enhancing our work-life balance. And I find that one of the things, uh, which is really the premise of our discussion today, one of the things that interferes, or, or maybe it's a fear that people have in their ability to, to do this, or, um, they, you know, get part of the way down that road and they realize that they there are some things that they don't know they don't know or maybe some things that they do know they don't know. Uh, but the number one thing that I find that interferes with people's ability to achieve that outcome is effectively scaling. You know, what is the the, the system of scaling an enterprise going from one location to multiple um, or from our perspective going from owning one franchise to owning multiple franchises? OK, um, and I find that uh, scaling. I find that the the number one thing that interferes with a doctor's ability to scale his or her enterprise is lack of structure. Um, unclear expectations, um, less effective communication, roles and responsibilities standard operating procedures. When you go from one location to multiple locations, you need things much more turnkey. And so if you've, if you've built one very successful practice and you've got all that stuff figured out and the systems and optimization, you know, is all figured out, then you can just basically pick that template up and go drop it in multiple other locations. But you need a structure to do that. And the number one structure is span of management. Because, you know, we talk about this with our, our even our single location clients, um, sourcing accountability, where you've got the doctor as the, the CEO or executive, and then you've got six department source people. And that is, you know, what I might term is like tier one structure, right? And just single location practice. And that's where it all starts. Um, and department source meetings and the quality request, quality response and effective communication, the coaching model leveraging those systems to create accountability in those six departments. Because if you can't create accountability in those six departments, you're certainly not going to be able to do it in three locations simultaneously. You know, so it all starts there. And then as you get really good at that with one location, now we have in essence identified who our key players are, because if you're not an effective administrative source person, you're certainly not going to be an effective regional administrator or regional manager. OK, and so the cream always rises to the top. So, um, Sam, Carrie, Jocelyn, what would you what would you suggest 
and and you know the the offices that you work with, and then the offices that you have that are looking at it scaling into multiple locations or bringing in multiple providers and having multiple doctors or potentially itinerant specialists. What do you tend to find are the barriers to getting them from point A to point B? I think one of the things that we've we've run into with a couple of um, with with a couple of my clients is. Um, you know, you, you have these things that happen in your practice that are unforeseen. So people are sick, um, people are on vacation and things like that. And when, when the doctor is that person, it's more difficult for them to be consistent with the source meetings and to truly let go of all the things they're supposed to let go of for that. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that we talked to, talk to one of the doctors about is, is making, one of their source people, who's also kind of an office manager, um, the person that the source people come to. And so then he just has to go to her. Um, but that's the, that those are the, and the doctors trust doctors, doctors don't always want to let go of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are the things I've run up against. Yeah. I say trust is a really big one. Yeah, I think one of the one of the biggest barriers that that I've seen is that when it comes to like the multiple locations that you know the 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 primary doctor is in that one location and maybe they've gotten it to where they want, they've gotten the structure, uh, but then you know to to do a different location, they're not necessarily going to be in that location. And so that's definitely a potential stress or something you know just that unknown of what the next location is going to be like and or if they already have that next location you know it's a constant management issue and so just like what you're talking about john as far as the you know the structures and the systems and that's what you've got to have locked in and dialed in uh before you can get that second third fourth fifth location um at least as far as being profitable not being a headache and all that kind of stuff so um, yeah, so on those lines, what do you guys see or what, what, you know, what would be the best way that, that you guys handle that as far as the doctor is not going to be in the second or third location? You know, how do you, how do you maximize that or make that effective? You know, one of the things that I think ha I've seen work very, very well is when the doctor has a very strong foothold in his culture, right? So he's <laughs> created a vision and he's got the culture set. And one of the things that I think helps bring that together is when they have at least once a month a team meeting where they bring all of their locations together that is culture vision driven you might cover structure and strategy in that meeting but the key i think that i've seen successful is when that culture is just part of the dialogue Mm -hmm. Here's how we treat the patient. Here's where our priorities are. Here's what it needs to look and feel like to be a patient of this practice, regardless of where you are. Uh, that when that initial foothold is established, that's when you have somebody that can scale, right? Because they understand, yeah, here's the systems that are going to work, and here's here's how that can go. The other divergent off of scalability to John's question is the ability and, and to bolt on to that trust concept is the ability to understand when you can no longer handle things most effectively in house. So at what point do I need to outsource pieces of my practice? If it's AR collections, insurance management, things like that, having a vision for what do I need to delegate? What do I need to automate? Uh, and what do I just need to eliminate from my practice? What is no longer, what does not serve me that ser served me when I had a single office, you know, and having that kind of robust conversation. But I really feel like for, for the ones I've seen successful at it, it's because they understand and have nuanced in the culture and their vision. What a great point, Carrie. We talk all, all the time about how system can, can, how culture can eat systems for lunch. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's not just the systems that have to be in place. Great point. Yeah. You brought up, a, you brought up an interesting point <clears throat> when it comes to either, and I would say you can go one of two directions, centralization or, or, or automation, right? And I think that those two things are, they're necessary. I mean, that, that's arbitrage. Those are synergies within a multiple location 
enterprise that we can capitalize on and you can centralize billing and insurance and accounts receivable and even scheduling. Um, and it helps to lower the costs associated with, with each individual practice, lower the overhead and enhance profitability. Um, just based on my experience, I think I would absolutely 100% recommend centralization over um, outsourcing. Um, I haven't had too many outsourcing experiences that were um, where the the net value that we received was equivalent to having trained personnel in the office. Um, and as long as they're trained personnel and you're just responsible with your, your payroll allocations, uh, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's less expensive to, to outsource. Um, because I, I tend to find out the more insurance driven the practice, when you start getting into HMOs and DMOs and Medicaid and, the more your margins are pinched, the more it becomes necessary to to keep your cost to a bare minimum. But I think the patient experience really suffers. Oh yeah. It's now it's now we're getting into a scenario where, you know, I call to I, I call to talk to somebody at the office about my bill, and they say, "Oh, well, we don't handle it here. You're going to have to call this number," and that's just a huge inconvenience to me. As opposed to them, the person that I need to speak to being there at the office, they can jump on the phone. There's there's value there. Yeah. And that's going to translate into patient attrition. It's going to translate into recare effectiveness. Ultimately, practice the practice value will be impacted. So I don't know. I know that there are folks out there that are really good with um, with you know taking some of those responsibilities away from the practice. I know they're good at what they do. So I'm not saying that it's their fault, but you're adding a layer of communication and communication is where most of the breakdowns occur. So there, it's expectations weren't clear. I didn't really understand how this system worked or what you do versus what you don't do. And now it's just, it's all the, all the inefficiencies associated with that, I think are just, I don't know. I, I just, I, I, have, I have not bought into that strategy full force. There, there are times where I think it's, there are times where I think it's very beneficial. Like if you're having turnover at the front desk and you don't have anybody that can handle AR, mm -hmm. we, we got to get AR handled. We need somebody following up on insurance claims. But if you're at a point where you've got retention and you've got a solid crew up front and they know what they're doing, I, I just, I just. Two different dynamics, right? And what happens yeah. when you have a practice that has one office that has phenomenal insurance management, but you have another new office that you brought on where it's a mess? Or you have two offices that you brought on that's a mess. And especially what happens in those practices where you're struggling to keep um, a team, you know, mm -hmm. when you have turnover. And the hiring environment right now or the, or the retention environment right now isn't speaking to a lot of stability. Yeah, it's tricky. It is. And again, that comes back to culture and that comes back to the team you're building mm -hmm. and everything like that. But but even that, um, how do you mitigate for some of that? So if you centralize and you have four practices, are you saying with centralization, if you have like four offices, one, you know, practice that you have one central place that's handling things like AR, collections, insurance, all of that. Mm -hmm. And so they still have to call somewhere else, right? Not necessarily, because if they're, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, and matter of fact, more often than not, we'll have the the billing office or the central central office is in the parent practice. Practice, yeah. Right, like they've got rooms set aside over here where they've got computers and phones, and that's where all their administrative people come from. But they can transfer phone calls. You know, but I still like, can't settle my bill when I'm in. If I'm in a satellite office. And I want to talk to a, the billing person about a discrepancy. I'm still going to have to call the central office that might not be able to be handled for me in the satellite office. I don't know. Don't they, aren't there like VO, VOIP systems where if I'm in location number one, I can transfer the phone call to location number two? Do they have to hang up the phone and have them call another another number? Not necessarily. I think it's just however it's because VO, VOIP is, is internet based. So mm -hmm. They, they can transfer on those types of systems. Yeah, I believe they can. I believe they can. And I, I think ultimately the goal there is to, to get most of that being done through links and texts and emails anyway. 
right. and fewer phone calls. You know, but there's you've still got the the older portions of a, of our society there that are going to prefer the the I want to call and pay over the phone. Or you've got the face to face, right? I'm in the office. I want to set. I have a question about my bill, mm-hmm. but I'm in a satellite office. The person that would be able to answer that is not in that office. So is the need for better outsourcing? Is the need for the outsourcing game to get stepped up? Is there, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at it because the, the concept around centralization is, is magnified. I mean, if you're in, you don't feel it unless you're in a satellite office, right? So if you're in the home office and you're in that home practice, you don't feel the missing component. If you're in the satellite office and you have patients in those satellite offices that need something different, they might feel differently about it and not see the distinction. True. It's, I think it's, I think that either way, if you're going to scale, you have to figure out a way to make that as seamless as possible, mm-hmm. to make that as integrated and cultural as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, hmm. And make sure that everybody knows how to answer the questions that might be asked. I mean, I think that training can be done. Back to Just like we're saying, yeah, communication, right? As long as the message is conveyed correctly, then yeah, you shouldn't have any issues. Yeah, I'd say that that's, I think training and development is another, uh, another big shortcoming you know, as, as practices scale and they get bigger as they, they misprioritize or miss, yeah, misprioritize and misallocate financial resources. Um, because I, I mean, I remember my days with FedEx, man, there, there wasn't a day that went by that there wasn't some kind of course on our LMS that I had to go take on what conflict resolution, leadership development, whatever, customer service, whatever it was like, it was, it was never ending. It was constant. You know, and it, I don't know that a day went by where I didn't have to jump into the LMS and do an hour worth of training at least, you know. Um, so I think there's, I think that certainly needs to be prioritized. Training and development needs to be an ongoing conversation, not something that, you know, once once they understand how to do insurance, okay, we've got them trained and we're done. No, you yeah. just starting. You need to get into patient experience and advocacy. You need to get into, you know, leadership and accountability and, uh, conflict resolution and you know there's still a lot of stuff that they need to be trained on you know which is i think and this this isn't a a, a, sh- a shameless plug you know for fortune but i think that's a, a great asset that you know we're able to bring to the table is we've got that recurring training and development system in place you know to where as you bring in new people what a lot of our clients do after they've been through the the training camps um, and then they bring in, bring on two or three new people, then they send their two or three new people, you know, with a couple of senior people just to get them up to speed. And so we're constantly just refining and refining. It's, I can't remember who said this, might've been maybe Theodore Roosevelt, maybe or Winston Churchill, but they said, um, give me an ax and I'll spend the first hour sharpening the ax. Or if I'm going to link out a tree. I've got like, what well, I can't remember what he said. If I've got an hour to cut down a tree, I'm going to spend the first 50 minutes sharpening the ax. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's, I mean, that's the con, that's the theory behind that is just training and development. Yeah. And a lot of it is, oh, go ahead, No, go on, Sam. I'll, I was just going to say that, um, you know, just as far as the training and all that stuff goes, we all know that, you know, what, what you, what you spend your focus on and what you, you know, you measure and, you know, you monitor, that's what you're going to get results on. So what happens is, you know, maybe we'll master one thing, but then you move on to the next thing. And then you kind of forget that last little bit of training. So just having that constant training, even though you know how to do it, you just kind of forget that, oh yeah, I need to go back and do that. So that is one of the big things that I like about our training. It's continuous. A lot of the same stuff over and over, over the years, um, but you just get that repetition. I totally agree with you. And I think that, um, you know, what that brought to mind is that one of the things that I've been talking to a lot of my clients about is CEO time, right? So, so 
so many dentists are heads down in the skill doing that work, but really they need to start the bigger your organization grows. You actually have to carve out time for thinking about your business. And then you have to carve out that time for training and developing how to take it to the next level. And so everybody thinks it's just about adding more hygiene hours and adding more doctor, you know, restorative hours and adding, but really the bigger your business is, the more time you need to be focused on thinking about your business and then training and developing to your business. Completely agree with you. Well, and I, I, you know, that the, the patient portal on playbook is, I mean, isn't that the whole point of that, that they can go in and watch the camps and or all, look at all the materials so they can learn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, and it's got the capacity for us to assign training. So if you've got a new person coming in or you got somebody that, that needs a, you know, uh, just a, a review on scheduling to go or a review on reactivation or something like that, then you can assign that to them. It'll send them an email. They can click the link, log in, and then watch the videos and then take the assessment and then get like, you know, checked off or completed or certified or whatever in that particular area. You know, before I forget, one of the things too that I think a lot of people don't scale as their business grows and they don't consider is how to, what they're monitoring, what they're measuring. And the reason I say that is very often doctors have a very good understanding of what's happening in their, their core practice but they have very little idea on what their numbers are in their satellite practices. They have very little Mm -hmm. idea of what they're rolling out is working, not working. And I think it's an awareness that needs to be developed about, you can roll out a hundred great new ideas, but if you don't measure how well those are landing and you don't have a vehicle to have a regular conversation as far as accountabilities, that's where the consistency of what made your initial practice really, really great falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're, you're definitely going to have to have, and this is one of the shortfalls of dental Intel. Um, I'm curious to know if, if at it has built this feature in yet, because we discussed it at one of our F50 meetings. Uh, I don't know, not the last one, but the one before maybe uh, in Charlotte. Um, but I, I posed this question and it, I got the impression that, th- that this feature was not there, but that they're, they've taken note and they're going to build it in and it's enterprise level data. So I need to be able to see, cause I, I, for my multiple location folks, and I've got quite a few of them, you know, I, I need to see the, the practice level data. Yeah. So I know how each practice is performing, but I also need to know how the enterprise collectively is performing. Right. Because as a CEO, I don't necessarily have the oper- I don't necessarily have the time to go look through all the information for four, five, six, seven practices. But if I've got an enterprise dashboard or enterprise monitor, and I know with our, our F50 folks, we're using a like an executive scorecard that's got like, you know, eight to 12 key performance indicators that are executive level, you know, um, metrics. Okay. But the the, the concept is is that the, the the global metric is influenced by five other things. Okay, so this is at the very top, like production, right? Well, what influences production? Treatment acceptance, treatment reactivation, mm-hmm. success with treatment reactivation, production per visit, production per hour, recare effectiveness, all those things affect production. So if production is trending negative, then now I can like drill down and find out which of those five or six variables are causing that. Cause you might have three or four of them are doing well, but two or three of them are starting to suffer. Right. So I don't have to like try to eat the whole elephant in one bite. I can look at an enterprise level and say what top three to five numbers aren't moving in the direction that I want them to move and then drill down and find out in which practices are those numbers suffering. And then, and then, address that in each of those practices. You follow what I'm saying? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. So you, you've got to have enterprise level information. So I, I don't, I, if you don't, I, I think it's going to be, not that you can't be effective, but I think it's, it's going to be a lot less efficient. It's going to require a lot more time. Cause you look at us. I mean, we we're 
got anywhere from 10 to 20 clients, right? 10 to 20 different offices that you've got to like go in and look at monitors on. I would love if Dental Intel had an enterprise feature to where I could see how are all of them performing collectively? Like where, where am I doing a really good job and where am I not doing such a good job? You know, and right now I've got to go to every individual account and each dashboard and all that stuff just to get the information that I need rather than being able to see it on a global level. I think that'd be a great tool to have. Agreed. That would be cool. One thing I wanted to circle back on, it's a comment that came up earlier, was the, the leadership side. So I do find that one mistake that a lot of folks make when they're trying to go from one location to two, three, four is if they've got one really successful location and there's a lot of financial resources available to reinvest, I think that's a great thing to do is to reinvest in a business that you've shown to be successful in. Um, but they they can scale too quickly sometimes. And so they'll go from one location to four locations in you know three years. And they may or may not have necessarily bought the other three locations with the same goals in mind that they bought the first one. And they might have not have bought the, bought the right locations. And so now those locations, A, they just quintupled their span of management. So now they're going to be less effective per person. And most likely they bought practices that were deteriorating, which means they needed a strong leadership presence. And you can't be in four places at one time. And so you just kind of compounded the result now, right? And so I'll see that oftentimes. And then I'll see folks that, you know, have a single location and then they buy a two day a week practice over here and they're operating as a satellite. And I'm like, that's great if you just want to work six days a week, but that's never going to become a million dollar practice doing that that way. Like that, I mean, a, a million dollar practice requires a million dollar commitment. You know what I mean? Full time practice requires full time commitment. Mm-hmm. It's the same conversation that we have with associates when they're trying to work a, a part time associateship over here to cover the expenses and their practice. There comes a point in time where you're just going to have to take the leap of faith and step away from the associateship and go all in, you know, on your dream. Otherwise, it's a part time gig. I think that. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I see is that people, they want to move forward on opportunity. Like they're trying to be opportunistic, like this practice just came up. It's a really good deal. And what happens is they haven't done the preliminary work to figure out what am I wanting to build? Exactly. Mm-hmm. What do I want? What do I want my life to look like? What do I want my practices to look like? What do I want my cash flow to look like? What do I want my, my balance sheet to look like or my, my PL to look like? What do I want? what do I want my practice to be known for and then buy those practices based on that fitting the vision. People get it all backwards, right? They're like, Oh, this is a really good deal. This practice just went up for sale. It's in a town that's underserved. And I'm like, okay, great. But does that serve you? Because what I hear you saying is you want to do X, Y, Z. So if buying that practice is actually moving you further from this, help me see that where that disconnect is. And I'm not saying that that's not a good investment. I'm saying we need to figure a different workaround because the way you have it framed right now is moving you away from your vision, not towards it. So let's get that clean and clear and, and exercising that before you go in and just start grabbing deals because they're a good deal because they're not a good deal if they don't serve your ultimate vision. That lack of clarity is why people scale too quickly. Yeah, so along those lines, Carrie, I got a I got a question for everybody. But uh, so I think what we typically see with the doctors that have multiple locations is they're very entrepreneurial and that they have that mindset that they want to grow. Would you guys suggest uh, a doctor that maybe isn't entrepreneurial still going for multiple locations, or is it better for them to focus on that one location? I think it depends on what their skill set is. Because every dentist wears three hats. They're a CEO, they're a dentist, and they're a manager. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a CEO skill set, 
because I mean, owning one location, the leadership, the level of leadership that require that's required to be successful at three, four, five, six locations is not the same level that's required with one location. You know, think about John C. Maxwell's five levels of leadership, right? Mm-hmm. You can be a successful single practice owner and do 1.5 million and take home 400,000, 500,000 um, as a, as a owner operator um, and not be a great leader, mm-hmm. not be a great communicator. I mean, you can be successful in private practice dentistry fairly easily. Okay. <laughs> Um, but when you start getting into multiple locations, man, you're creating, there's a whole nother dynamic there. Right. Um, and y'all are right. I mean, culture is the, is a huge factor. And so if I think that I can, if I think I'm going to buy three other locations and put associates in there and those three other locations are going to grow into what my practice has become just because I'm the one that bought it, you better think again, that's not how it works. If you're not willing to step out of this practice and go install the culture in those practices, or if you don't know for a fact that those associates that you plugged in those other offices have subscribed to your vision and direction and leadership, and they lead the same, if they can't replicate the culture that you've installed here, then man, you're, it's, it's going to be very, it's going to be very difficult. So um, I think it depends on what their skill set is because there's a lot of phenomenal clinicians out there that are horrible managers. That's true. You know? And there are a yeah. lot of very entrepreneurial dentists out there that are great business people that are horrible clinicians. So, and I, I, this isn't my opinion. I don't know the difference between one clinician or another. This is just feedback I get from talking to colleagues, you know, throughout the industry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, and, and, and honestly, that's just not their interest. You know what I mean? There are people that are really focused on crafting their skill as a clinician. There are other people that are more interested in, in financial prosperity and entrepreneurship. And there's nothing wrong with which there's nothing wrong with either one of those. You know, if it makes you happy, that's what you should be doing. But don't go buy four, don't go try to build four or five locations because that's what everybody else is doing. You think right. that's what's expected of you. Agreed. Because, yep. I mean, that may be the dream that God placed on somebody else's heart, but if He didn't place it on yours, you're 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 going down the wrong road. It's going to be rocky. Yeah, very much agree. So you know, it's a funny thing because so often it's about order of operation, right? It's it's the other thing that I think, Sam, to your point, is that people need to surround themselves with the people that can um, either either have a skill that you don't or enhance the skills that you have in order to build that out. So I I feel like there's a way through anything, but if you are not of that entrepreneurial spirit, but you want something bigger than what you've got, you have to engage the people that are going to help you deliver that and not take on only only that, right? So you might go, okay, I, I do have, I aspire to have something bigger. I'm not a big entrepreneur. I'm not a big risk taker. How do I do this? How do I, you know, maybe your passion is to serve more people and you can't figure out how to do it in the, in the structure. There's, there's a lot of things that are going to drive that, that might not be that, Hey, I'm going to be the guy that owns 15 practices kind of guy, you know, mm-hmm. great question. And so I'm just sitting here thinking about, it, and I think the first thing you'd have to do is you'd have to surround yourself with somebody who can complement your vision and maybe has a little bit of a different skill set than you have, you know? Yeah. And, and to clarify, I don't mean that I, I'm not saying be afraid of scaling. I'm not saying be afraid of bringing in multiple, multiple providers. Don't be afraid of getting a second, third location. You know, don't be afraid of it. Um, I mean, the, the market that we're entering into is, go, is phenomenal for private practice ownership. Yes. So the last two or three years, DSOs have had an absolute heyday. Um, they've been overpaying over paying for practices. They've been heavily funded from by private equity. Banks have been very friendly with their money. The push, the purse strings have been very loose. Um, and when money's easy to come by, people overpay for things. And yep. so DSOs have been scooping up practices left and right. They've been overpaying for them and they've been inflating the market. And the market has had dental practices overvalued. Well, overvalued practices are more difficult for private practice owners to buy 
because the bank's only going to lend me 100% of the previous 12 months, you know, if they're doing 100% financing. So if the practice is valued at 115%, or if I've got to pay 125% just to compete with the DSO, I might not have the 25% setting in the bank to come out of pocket. And if the seller's not willing to carry a note or something like that, then I just, the, 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 the path to practice ownership for private practice owners has been really constricted with DSOs on such a rampage. But what we're seeing or what has happened in the first two quarters of this year is DSOs are at an unprecedented low. Like they're not buying anything. Okay. Not only are they not buying, they're liquidating. They're divesting some of their practices. They're underperforming right. practices because mm-hmm. they're, their, their funding arm is demanding returns, is wanting some money back. Mm-hmm. So what that means is, is that over the next 12, 18, 24 months, typically when we do valuations, we're looking at the last three years and we're just six months into this change. So it's going to take a little time, but those practice values are going to start coming down and it's going to make it easier for private, for, for private practice owners to acquire locations. Funding is going to be easier to come by. So mm-hmm. when you look at rates going up and inflation and the work and 45% of the workforce deciding to stay home or changing industries, um, Jocelyn, that was a great article you shared the other day. I think it was um, the, the healthcare field, the healthcare industry has lost 51%. 51% of its employees pre-COVID have left the healthcare industry, wow. which means 51% of the employees that are in the market in the field now came from other industries into healthcare or they just were never replaced, you know, and with the rate at which hygienists, uh, the hygiene schools and assisting schools are graduating these people. We were about 18 months away, about six months ago. So we're about another 12 months before we ever, before we're even going to replace what we lost, you know, so you take all those impending recession, all those things into consideration. This is why, you know, your, your financial institutions have taken a step back and said, wait a second, we got to make sure that we've got liquidity. You know, but you, you couple that with the advancements, the technology that we're seeing um, in dentistry, it's just getting faster and faster. I mean, I think the new three-shape intraoral scanner that came out, I was watching a video on Instagram the other day, a full, uh, a full arch scan in like 20 seconds, 15 seconds. You know what I mean? With, with the rate at which technology is advancing and with the practice values coming down, and money uh, um, will ultimately become easier to get your hands on. I mean, the the private practice ownership is, I mean, looking incredible, you know, for the future. What are the dentists, do you see the dentists? I haven't had any dentists that have been attempting to purchase yet um, a practice that a DSO is trying to shed, right? That doesn't fit their portfolio, doesn't fit their model, didn't have the returns yet. But my concern on that would be that if they overpaid for that practice, the private dentist isn't going to want to overpay for it again, right? So it hasn't been profitable. The DSO, are they are the DSOs in a position where they're ready to take a loss on it? Has anybody encountered that scenario yet? Because most of the practices that I see being purchased right now in my market are from dentists that either aged out or passed away and mm-hmm. are being trying are, you know, in kind of a quick push sell off kind of a thing. I'm not seeing a lot of current practices changing hands. Yeah, they they will absolutely take a loss on it. The reason why is, is it's more valuable to them to get an underperforming asset off their books Mm -hmm. than it is to get 95% on the, on the dollar. So what's more important to them is, is, is offloading that asset. So it's not dragging their their entity, their enterprise value down, right? Are you, so seeing, that? Like, I what's mean, are that? you, seeing, are you seeing that in your market? Yeah. I'm not seeing any of it in mine. Yet. Yeah, there's a, I don't want to disclose names, but there's a, um, there's right. a, a transaction that's on the table for a client of mine right now. That's a DSO, a, a well-known large DSO. Wow. And they're divesting one of their locations. Now, whether we acquire it or not is really, is going to depend on a variety of things because this is a market where associates aren't easy to come by. Well, what are DSOs really good at? Attracting associates and giving them relocation stipends. Yeah. You know, student loan reimbursement and all this kind of stuff. So 
when when we factor all that stuff in, what it's going to cost us to bring an associate up there, does it make sense for us to acquire that as an additional location? No, but does it make sense for us to acquire the patients and merge them into our existing location? 100%. So we're not going to pay them the same for a chart sale that we would to buy that practice. Right. So would would they be interested in just in just unloading it? 100% yes, they would be. And they'll unload just the goodwill port. I mean, just the patient portion and not. Yeah, because they can sell the equipment and stuff to a wholesaler. You know, they're, right. they're not going to get, they're not going to get full value on it, nor should sure. they expect to get full value on it. It's an underperforming, probably if it was a profitable practice, they wouldn't be selling it. Right. Sure. You know, and it's an underperforming, it's an underperforming practice. So they're, they're just trying to get an underperforming asset off their books. They're not trying to make money on it. Great dynamic. I haven't, we haven't, had that situation really hitting this market yet. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I say, there's a lot Mm -hmm. for sale, but most of what's for sale are practices that are aging out. Yeah. I I bet it's there. I bet it's there, but get what you look for. Right. That's true. Private private (laughs) practice dentists that are looking to acquire additional locations are not looking at practices being sold by DSOs. They're looking for other private practices. True. And that's why they're not finding them. There, there's, there are just as many of those out there right now as there. Well, maybe not just as many, but 2080. You know what I mean? Twenty percent of the practices out there that are for sale are going to be divestitures from BSOs. You know what a great watch out! Like what a great awareness for your existing doctors to be looking at because mm-hmm. there's there is potential there. Because yeah, I've talked, often, to a, I've talked to a few regional BSOs recently. Um, because we had done some, some mailers, we had done some, some merger and acquisition distributions. Um, and then my contact information was on them. And so they reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, we're interested in buying practices. Do you have one for sale? And I said, well, no, coincidentally, we're interested in buying practices. Do you have one for sale? And they're like, well, we're not selling any at the moment. Uh, but I'll keep your contact information. And we, we had some discussion and this was, this is what this is what the, this business development. Um, the uh, what does he call himself? Director of business development for a, I think they've got 150 locations um, in like four or five states. So there's a bunch of those out there that yeah, I mean if they, they sell practices too, it's not just private private yeah. practice owners on practices. Mm-hmm. Hadn't even considered it mm-hmm. like that kind of an outreach to get something like that going. Yeah, phenomenal. So it's just you get what you look for. Yeah. Yeah. Not true. Yeah, it was interesting when I didn't know that either until they started calling me. And they started calling me and says, Hey, and we started having a conversation. I was like, Okay, so yeah. Yeah, okay. So y'all do sell practices then. I was like, interesting. Okay. So I mean, it it wasn't something that I've always known. It was something that I discovered just in the last, you know, few years as we were, you know, accelerating our path to to growth. I like it. You know, there's a lot when you think about it right now, there's a lot of upside on that, especially if you have a doctor with a lot of liquid, um, like that is financially liquid mm-hmm. and has that capability. If you didn't have to go out and borrow a great deal of money, you really could. It's like the stock market, right? You're buying mm-hmm. when everybody's hurting. Same principle mm-hmm. applies. If you have a DSO that's trying to offload something and you can get it below market and you don't have to take out a lot of financial support to do that where you're losing some of the value in, in paying the interest, you know, and money's still, frankly, money's pretty cheap still. But mm-hmm. um, I mean, I remember my parents having a, you know, in the eighties, a mortgage and they were paying 15% on a mortgage. Right? So, I mean, still relatively money's fairly cheap, but if you could do that, you could really have a good position. You could be really in a good position. Yeah. I, you just, you got to get creative. Yeah. It's you got to get creative. You're going to, some of these, some of these private practices are going to have to um, get outside the box a little bit on their associate acquisition and retention. You know, they've got this, this model that they're trying to meet that says, you know, 24 cents of every dollar, the, the associate should, should cost me, or uh, not 24%, but the associate should cost me 20% of every dollar, you know, um, and it may be less than that. Depends on where you're located. If you're in a market where there's plenty of associates, then, 
yeah, you'll probably get away with that. Your business model impacts that too. If you're HMOs and BMOs and Medicaid, you know, there's just, there's not an, as much revenue there, you know? So you're, you're, when you're looking at national averages, I think the national average for payroll allocation is like 28%, right? The, 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 the national average for associate income, I think is 180,000. So that's an average. That means you've got associates making 500 plus thousand dollars a year and you've got associates making 40. Mm-hmm. You've got payroll percentages that are in the 40, 45, 46, 47. You've got payroll percentages that are in the teens. You know, so you just can't, yeah. it's, it's not apples to apples. <laughs> so, well, you know, the, the other thing too, I mean, is anybody finding that one of the challenges with expanding is making sure that you have enough hygienists available to you, right? So if you're going to scale and you know a lot of your restorative work is going to come through your hygiene, how do you, it's not just getting an associate dentist or enough associate dentists, but it's also getting your other, you know, your hygiene practitioners in there. Yeah. That's a, that is one of the biggest scaling challenges right now for a couple of my practices, especially my practices that are in rural locations. Yeah. It's a significant challenge. Yeah, that is um there's that's an interesting discussion to have. I think we probably have a whole nother podcast just on right. that. But yeah. like I yeah. just I just uh, was just having this conversation with one of my clients earlier this week where you know looking at what his hygienists are making and looking at what the market bears for hygienists where he's located, his hygienists were underpaid by several dollars. Um and he had just lost a hygienist. I was like, look, we can't lose hygienists, you know. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. you're participating in a lot of insurance plans. This was a practice that used to participate in Medicaid. Mm-hmm. Uh, we discontinued Medicaid. Um, he's still heavily PPO driven. And his and we we we've got a big project that we're a big reverse merger project that we're um that we're making our way through now that'll put him in a really good bargaining position to renegotiate reimbursements. But we can't do that just yet. If he does that right now, his reimbursements aren't going to be as favorable as they would be when his practice is doing 1.8 million. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying so we we need to table that project until this merger project's complete, and then we can do that. But it's not his hygienist's fault that he's writing off 45% of his fee mm-hmm. because the same hygienist could go to a fee for service office and make $45 an hour. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So we had a discussion, we did the math and we gave all three of his hygienists a $4 an hour raise. Nice. $4 an hour, $4 an hour raise. Did that impact their four. bonuses? Is that impacting that, bonus then? Yeah. It will affect their payroll percentage, but mm-hmm. I know what's about to happen. Mm-hmm. I know where he's at now. And I know mm-hmm. he's fixing to complete a merger with a practice collecting about uh, not about uh, six or 700,000. Mm-hmm. And we will merge those two together. We're going to drop, 60 to 65 cents of every dollar to the bottom line. Nice. So adding that $4 an hour to hygiene payroll will make payroll jump up. But as soon as we add that additional restorative revenue, it's going to drop it right back down lower than where it is now. And his hygienists are making more and we're not at risk of losing them. Brilliant. You know, you can't, you're not, if you don't have hygienists in there, you're not going to do any restorative dentistry. Right. You know, unless you're going to do the hygiene yourself. So you just, you you may have to, to pay a little more um, you know, to, to keep them happy and all that kind of stuff. And I would say culture is a much better culture, fair treatment, professional development assistance. There are a lot of things that you can do besides increasing payroll. For example, okay, rather than giving them a two dollar an hour raise, okay, give them health insurance. Because let's say you give them a two dollar an hour raise, and that equates to five hundred dollars a month. Okay, well, five hundred dollars a month plus withholdings, right? So it's really not costing you five hundred dollars a month. It's going to cost you more than that because you got to pay taxes on it. Um, but what if you just got them a health insurance policy for three eighty five or four hundred a month? You're not paying payroll taxes on that. It's still a benefit. It's still compensation. It's just not costing you as much as it would if you gave them a raise. And there's a ton of people out there looking for benefits. Yeah. Yes. And so there's, and I mean, quite frankly, and I don't say this to don't mislead people or anything like that. 
that the and I, I'm in this category. I didn't have the slightest idea how health insurance worked until just several a few years ago. They pay in and out of network and 50% on this and 20% on that. And here's my deductible and my copay. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't have the slightest idea. Right. Which plant when I was at FedEx and I we had to do our our opt-ins stuff every year, like are you going to opt in or opt out? Which tier do you want to be on? Didn't have the slightest idea how that worked. You know which tier I picked? The one that cost me the least amount of money. <laughs> which is which one is the least out of my paycheck? That's the one I always picked. And that's how 99% of employees pick their health insurance plans. Yeah. You know, so I mean, you're you're if you want a, a lower premium, you're going to have a bigger deductible. Yeah. Right? I mean, so just go with a plan that, that that makes sense, fits your budget. And now when you're recruiting employees, you can fly that flag that says we offer health insurance. It's going to make you much more attractive as an employer. And it doesn't also, cost you, it doesn't cost them anywhere near what you think, what, what you think it would. It also makes it fair for everybody, right? Yeah. So now you're not just um, showing preference to a portion of the practice that, that has a little more leverage. Now you're showing everybody that they're equal and yeah. they're valued equally. And I think that that's one of the challenges that a lot of people have gotten into. They're like, my hygienists are holding me hostage. I hear this a lot. And I'm like, well, be very careful on the messaging there. Well, I agree. It might be worth it to give them a raise. Be very cl- careful on your messaging because you do have a whole rest of your practice that is equally important. They're just not the ones, you know, that are that are vocal and i think that it's a very um when you look at scale it, that's why it comes back to culture and it comes back to communication it comes back to your vision and and making sure that everybody is equally valued there's a lot of beauty in that offering benefits because it it is a nice leveling you know what i mean it's a nice equalizer and it's less expensive for the practice itself yeah ultimately mm-hmm. and you're going to attract talent that's looking to stay right you want to have yeah. the reason people are looking for benefits is they want to stay somewhere they don't want to move in and out they don't yeah. want to have to wait to get you know to port it or to to get qualified or whatever they want to they want to have some stability there and and benefits are something that lead people to believe that they can start to structure their life in a very healthy manner so yeah and i mean like i said most people don't know the difference between a policy with a 200 dollars month premium and a 700 dollars month premium most people, you're mm-hmm. you're going to have more savvy people that have been educated. They understand that that means my copay is lower, my deductible is lower, my coverage is better. You know, you know what I mean. Like they understand that the vast majority of people don't. The only thing they know is you offer health insurance, and I need health insurance. Yeah. Great. So I mean, you don't have to break the bank to provide that benefit. Yeah. Um, well, even if they do know that they need a higher, you know, that they need that they need the higher tier health insurance in the dental industry, just having health insurance itself will, will offset it, the cost of them having to do that themselves, pay mm-hmm. for all of that themselves. So even if they are educated about that sort of thing, they still having any sort of health insurance, I think is a definite benefit and a definite, uh, definitely a good move for, for dentists to do. Sometimes yeah. I need to remember that John's not rolling his eyes. He's just thinking. Yeah, thinking. <laughs> so to, to get to, to provide just thought he was frozen. Of, to provide a little bit of framework to this. Okay. So because people will hear this and they'll be like, well, how do I know if I can afford to do that? Or how do I know if my people are fairly, you know, compensated and all that kind of stuff? Because most most are are, are are fairly intuitive when it comes to that stuff. They don't do like a, a full-fledged comp analysis to see. What's the minimum, maximum, and average that the market pays, that the market that you're in pays for this particular position? Okay. So I would say that's a great starting point. And so I would do that and find out for each position in your practice, what's the what's the bell curve look like? What's is the minimum starting entry level 18 and the maximum is 32 and the average is 26? And then where does your person fall in that range? Okay. Do you feel like they intuitively, do you feel like they are above or below average? And I would even go look at their performance, go into dental intel and look at, you know, perio acceptance and production per hour, look at how they're performing. Okay. Um, so 
where where do you feel like they should fall? Now, keep in mind, let's say that we've we've decided that this person should be making thirty five dollars an hour. Okay, that's thirty five dollars an hour gross wages. That thirty five dollars an hour includes what you're putting into their four hundred one k. It includes what you're paying in payroll taxes. It includes what um, uh, vacation pay. You know what I mean? So when you take their gross wages and you divide that across all the hours that they worked, it should be $35, okay? If it's higher than that or lower than that, then you can probably justify making some, some alterations, okay? But if the market, if the market where you're at, if average is 35 and your folks are at 32, then I would say that you're, especially the bigger the enterprise that you have, that's an elevated level of risk. If you're one location, you know, that's a risk, but it's not as risky as if you're three locations and you're at risk of losing a hygienist in each of your three locations. That's a much bigger financial impact. And I guarantee you that's going to cost you more than giving this person a dollar an hour raise. Now, I'm not a fan of just giving raises. I think that sets the wrong expectation. But I do think it that it warrants a discussion to be had about the value that that person is bringing to the table versus the value that you're paying for them. Um, and I think that you've got to draw the line between the executive variables and what's in their control. What's in their control is whether they have this conversation with the patient or not, whether they pick up the phone and reactivate patients. What's not in their control is your business model what insurance plans you elect to participate in, whether or not you're willing to put your fees where your fees should be positioned. They don't have control over that, in my opinion, should not suffer because that decision is not being made. Now, that's one analysis that I would look at. The other one, I would take a look at your P&L um, and I would break down your assistant, hygiene, and admin and what percentages of revenue do each of those categories represent. And so theoretically, your assistance would be somewhere between four and six percent of revenue. Admin would be between four and six percent of revenue and hygiene would be between six and eight. And if you do the math on that, that's a range of 16 to 20. OK, which seems incredibly low. Yes, it does. Very conservative. OK, but I would rather target a conservative number than to, to, and move towards that number as opposed to targeting 30% and potentially moving towards that number. <laughs> right? So, um, so I would be concerned, I would be conservative there. Um, but that does a couple of things for me. It helps me, it helps me understand the importance of making the right executive decisions. You know, if I'm not scaling restorative production or adding procedures, you know, to our restorative um, repertoire or, you know, bringing in out itinerant specialists that do procedures that I don't and that kind of stuff. If I'm not scaling restorative revenue, then my payroll allocation is going to be higher. So seeing that, being aware of where that's at, encourages me to be more responsible with the executive decisions that I'm making. And everybody benefits from that. It also helps me to determine if, if we are in a position to bring on the next person, well, which one of those three do I bring on? Because mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm at 15% on hygienists <laughs> and I'm at 2% on admin, that makes it pretty easy to see I'm not hiring another hygienist. The next person I hire is going to the admi administrative department, or the next person I hire is going to be an assistant. You know, so it, it's it's just so let's say that your payroll's at 30%. Okay. So at 30%, um, then you're probably going to have. What's that going to be? Um, you're probably going to have eight to ten percent, eight to ten, eight, eight, twenty-four. Yeah, you're probably going to have eight to ten percent in admin, eight to ten percent in assistance, and probably twelve to fifteen on hygiene. Right. So just take. You're the, looking at their the salary, the percentage. Yeah. Salary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So total, so total, total yep. wages paid to hygienists, total pages wages paid to assistance, and right. what percentage <laughs> of revenue do they represent? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if your payroll percentage is currently at 34%, then don't use my four to six, four to six, six to eight. Okay, because you're at 
Mm-hmm. And those percent, those recommendations are based on a practice that's at 20. I got you. Okay. Now I would I would suggest that you make I would suggest that you explore options to move your payroll allocation towards 20 because that's profitability in your practice. And do so while making sure that your people are fat and happy. They're motivated, they're incentivized, they're encouraged, they are accountable, um, and they're helping you drive the bus forward. So I just, I can't, what, what, I, what I tend to see is when payroll allocations are, are way north of where they should be, there's, it, it's, there's a communication breakdown. There's people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing, you know, and it's not necessarily their fault. You know, there may just have not been clear expectations set. There may be no accountability, may have a really, really passive leadership style and a bunch of people that need a lot of direction. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's 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 not fair to just point your finger and say, oh, well, y'all, my people are so overpaid. Now, a matter of fact, I had this, this conversation not too long ago. I had a doctor who was in a, a rural part of Georgia and he, uh, he had uh, given his hygienist a raise, paying her way north of the market. I think the market was the market there was paying like 32, 33, and he was paying her like 48. Right. Like she was way north of the market. And every time I got on the phone with me, he complained about how much he's paying his hygienist. And I said, I don't want to hear your complaint one more time. You made the decision to pay her that. And he wanted to fire her so that he could find a cheaper hygienist. And I was like, not, does not work. You fire her and you fire me at the same time. <laughs> we're, going, we're just too different. You know what I mean? The answer it and the answer it and to, you can't shrink to grow. The answer it to find out what, how to cut that cost. The answer is to find out how to grow into that cost. Right. You see what I'm saying? That's going to serve you much better than just looking at where you can cut incremental expenses. You know, that's, that's why a scarcity, going back that's to what a scarcity oriented. Oh, you're fine. That's a scarcity oriented mindset, and it's going to get you scarcity oriented results. So don't don't shrink to grow, invest, and then grow into the investment. Sorry, going John. back to what you said about the, um, you know, make sure you're try to lower your your percentage, your payroll percentage, while still making sure your people are fat and happy. And that's why I think our our bonus program that we that we propose is is so great because it just it really does make it it innately makes people make more money mm-hmm. for working harder mm-hmm. and and that's that's the key is the yeah. the practice the practice grows the staff makes more money and everybody's happy yeah i i tell you what's so neat uh i don't know if y'all have experienced this or not i, I i'm I'm the world's greatest advocate of that of that profit sharing. I believe it's the purest, simplest compensation incentive program available to mankind. Okay, you cannot make more money unless you add value. It's impossible, and you can't uh, um, and you can't not make more money if you are adding value. It's impossible. So when you you introduce that to a team. And if there's a team that immediately hates it, okay, I don't, don't shoot the messenger. This might be a controversial statement, (laughs) but if there's a team that absolutely hates it, I would argue that the reason they hate it is because they have been getting too many handouts in the past and they're a little entitled and they expect things to come easier than they really do. Right. And they're not used to having to work for that incentive. But the teams that love it, are the teams that are used to busting their ass day in and day out, and they're not being a reward tied to their effort. And now all of a sudden they're already doing the work. Mm -hmm. They go straight into bonus mode and now they're like, heck yeah, now we're getting, you know, now we're benefiting from this extra work that we're doing. Whereas the more entitled team is going to say, Oh, you mean I have to start working for this stuff now? Well, shoot. I didn't know that's what we were signing up for. You know, and it's just, it's not as exciting. So, you know, it, it's interesting. Now, I'm not saying that's 100% of the time. 
So, like I said, don't don't get mad at me if that seems to hear. <laughs> but you know, it, it's it's true. You know, I think it's personal opinion. Yeah, y'all say y'all don't want to. <laughs> y'all don't want to jump on this bus with me, do you? <laughs> the willingness to do reactivation calls is a direct correlation. Yeah. The willingness to keep every single person in that practice in excellent health is in direct correlation with how people bonus. Right. When they are all in on the vision of keeping every patient healthy, not just the patients that come on their own all the time, but right. every single patient in that practice healthy, when they're all in and all on that bus, they bonus every time. When they are not connected to that vision, when they are like, I'm just going to do what walks in the door, I'm going to catch the fish that swims by, that's when they're like, ah, oh, we never bonus. Well, is it a, it's, you know, it's a mindset. It's purely uh, the ability to bonus on that bonus plan is simply a commitment and a mindset around serving every single patient in the practice. I think um, another another aspect of that is that, that teamwork is very, very, very important when it comes to that. And I, vice versa, I think the bonus structure makes teamwork happen. Yes, absolutely. It's such a beautiful supporter of that concept of teamwork. When everybody gets a bonus, everybody contributed, everybody worked together. Such a beautiful way of acknowledging that. Look what we did, right? Yeah. So what would you suggest? So looking at scaling a business, creating passive streams of income and um, enhancing work-life balance. So I would certainly say that one of the variables that fit into that conversation is scaling restorative production because there's only so much crown and bridge in a patient base. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you, you, and, and, there are much more profitable restorative procedures than crowns and bridges. So implants, ortho, um, sleep, very profitable, little doctor time, scale restorative production significantly. More um, endo. And, and essentially what, endo. what's that? More complex endo. So as long complex as you need endo. to yep. anterior premolar, yep. get into molar endo, guided yep. endo using your CBCT. Yeah. And so what happens over time is, is I, as I scale my scale, my skill set and invest in my training and development education, I can add more complex procedures. Well, now I'm producing more in a shorter period of time. I have added value. Mm -hmm. but I'm no longer I'm uh, I'm not so much paid for my time as much as I'm paid for what I know and what I can do. So I can add more value in a shorter period of time, which allows me to scale down the number of days that I see patients freeing up time to keep the culture yep. in my locations and spend time with my associates and focus on their training and development. Okay. Which absolutely contributes to work-life balance. Everybody, everybody's a, in the practice. Not yeah. So I think it's a, I think it's kind of a three pump, maybe more, but a three prong approach there that says um, structure and accountability um, employee retention and development, um, and scaling restorative production. I think you can even, so for a lot of practices, it's even scaling hygiene production as well, because if you've got a practice that doesn't do a lot of SRPs, it's not doing a lot of perio, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You're able to add that into the business plan and provide a, a, a broader, you know, if you're referring out a lot of your perio and you have hygienists that are skilled at doing that, they can bring a lot of that back in-house. Um, I think too, I see a lot of practices, as you were saying, you know, moving more into more and more cosmetic procedures, your veneers, your, your um, full mouth restorations, your, uh, you know, the whitening, the liners, obviously all of that when you see practices that are willing to take on these big cases, you know, your $30,000, $50,000 cases where you're doing a full mouth rehab and that sort of thing, that that's a scale, right? That's a competency scale, looking at that mouth, that bite, all of that and going, I can, I can fix that and keeping that in house and having a long-term project that is staged 
that's scalable too. So there's a, you're right on the restoration. There's so much involved in, in that. Um, the ability to add associate dentists into your practice and be able to scale to that. Mm -hmm. That's huge. There's a lot of ways for practices to grow that they don't even recognize. Yeah. So I think, uh, also kind of along what we were talking about earlier, also my AirPods died. So if y'all can hear me, okay. <laughs> the, um, John, you said this earlier, but just to kind of break it down. You know, we want the doctor to be paid as the CEO, paid as the landlord, and paid as the clinical director. And I think there's a lot of doctors out there that aren't doing that, um, you know, those three areas to make money on. Uh, and what I'm seeing, this is kind of more my opinion and real estate and all that stuff, but the, I think potentially with this recession coming, commercial real estate is going to get very cheap just because those big corporations are going to start pulling, you know, that's going to be one of the first things they cut is their square footage, is their commercial rentals, because they know they can, through COVID, they can do a lot of work from home. Um, so the, if the, if the, you know, owner doctor doesn't own his, his land or wants to build to suit whatever that looks like, I think this next six months, year, two years, whatever this looks like, is going to be a, a fantastic time for them to purchase their land at a discount and be paid as the landlord and, and do all that. Uh, I just think that's going to be a, a big, uh, you know, value for them that if they're not already doing that, that can be a great source of uh, passive income. Yeah. That's another great point too. Another great point there too, is um, on the real estate side, mm -hmm. you know, having the, having the commercial, real estate to not just accommodate your practice, but potentially several other tenants, you know, and so you're now being paid as a landlord through your practice. Um, and you're also create, you're also collecting passive income from your tenants and three or four other units in the same space. Um, yeah. And then when you decide to sell your practice or, you know, divest a minority, a minority stake, and as they transition you out, you can retain ownership of the real estate and then lease the real estate to them. Correct. You know, so, I mean, real estate is a, uh, yeah, I was curious about that on the commercial side, mm -hmm. you know, what was going to happen there. Cause I mean, residential properties are still appreciating. Oh yeah. Well, and that's another, you know, that may be a different time for a different topic, but you know, my real estate background, I mean, that's, if a doctor isn't entrepreneurial necessarily and doesn't want to own multiple locations, just investing in real estate, like residential, you know, and having a property manager do the whole thing. But that I mean, that's in my opinion, one of the best places to put your money. So if yeah. they don't want to be the 10 location doctor, they just want to focus on their one location, start buying residential. Because again, that's going to be this next year or two years, it's going to be at a discount. So it's going to be a good time to buy. You're nailing it because the thing is, is it's about diversification, right? If you have the ability to diversify your investments, 100%. I yep. agree with you 100%. Yeah, it's just a great, great place to put your money. It's also, I mean, it's very tax advantageous. You know, there's a lot of write-offs that go along with that. Uh, I mean, you know, if because odds are they don't want to manage it themselves. So even just having that property manager, that's a write-off. Yeah, it obviously cuts into your profit margin, but, you know, someone else is paying this asset. And I know, you know, I'm in the Nashville market and just the appreciation has gone through the roof. And I don't see, you know, this market going down necessarily. Um, but yeah, it just depends on where you are. But yeah, if you look at real estate over the last 30 years, I don't care where you are, it's pretty much gone up. So right. if you can just buy, and again, this is probably for a different, I don't want to get us off topic of off dentistry, but um, that could be just a huge, put your money into that and have 30 houses in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And there's a good retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So true. You know, we don't think about how to diversify their investments probably as often as we could in mm. things that are not um, a distraction, that are an, a nice bolt on, that can be outsourced, but that can kill, still create a revenue stream and create more stability long term. Great, yeah. great, great point. Well, I think that's a really good point too, Kara. Just like make sure it's not a distraction. Like if they are going to somehow manage it themselves, that they want to be Chip and Joanne or whatever, and they want to, be, you know, that's probably going to be a distraction. But if they want to, right, have a friend or a property manager, somebody they trust, that they just 
they take care of everything. I think that's a great place for doctors to uh, to potentially put there, especially in the next couple of years where this you're going to get some things at a discount, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's true. It's a true investment, right? That if they look yeah. at it like an investment and not another line of business, you're right. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. That is a cool. mind mapping conversation for another day, too. Yeah, yeah I appreciate it. Yeah, we're going to have to we're going to have to. Um, break a few of these out because I've, I've coming up, but basically what I'm part of the, my uh, desire in having this conversation with everyone was um, I'm building a series of events that I'm going to do around the Southeast that are tailored to either existing multi-location owners or people who are interested in scaling. Nice. And so um, I have these conversations with my clients all the time because I have multiple clients who are scaling and buying locations and we're doing M and A's and, uh, we've done some pretty creative things. I mean, I've got a fee for service office that's buying a PPO practice and merging that patient base in. And initially, the red flags go up because, like, wait a second, they're fee for service. They're immediately out of network. I recognize that, but when when their when their annual patient value is like fourteen hundred and sixty dollars, and the annual patient value of the practice that they're acquiring is like four hundred ninety five. Then I mean, it, you can do the math on that to figure out. Even if we lost fifty percent of the patients, that's still a two hundred eighty percent return with a twelve with a twelve month runtime. So in twelve months' time, they will have made they will have fully satisfied the whatever it was that they paid for the practice and, and made money on it just in the first twelve months. So you know what I mean. So there's a lot of creative things. Um, that we can do in there that traditionally wouldn't make sense. But I mean, when you dig in and take a look at it, it makes a lot of sense. Cause at the end of the day, I don't really care how many patients I got. I, I care how much revenue those patients are creating in my practice. True. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm okay losing some patients. If the net impact is a plus $485,000 and I paid 95,000 for the patients, you see what I'm saying? Like that's makes, that's makes a lot of business sense. So I've kind of started with four major points here, and I'm, I'm what I'm doing is just kind of um, developing the content for that series of events. But um, employee retention and development, we've determined that that is a key. Um, scaling restorative production, whether that be adding procedures or itinerant specialists, um, and employee retention and development includes both training and development, also employee acquisition employee dentist acquisition, minority partnerships, um, you know, uh, deferred comp, you know, a lot of the creative things that we do on the retention side, um, structure systems and op- optimization. So making sure that we've got the structure that supports accountability, um, the systems to produce consistent results and optimization so that we're monitoring at an enterprise level and at a practice level. Uh, and we can see it from an executive perspective and an operational perspective and make the effective decisions as they need to be made. And then the fourth one was leadership development and culture. That was the word that was missing and culture. I like it. So I think each of those four points right there could be four different events. Um so I've got to, I have to build the content out for those, but yeah, I'm looking at just over the next probably six to 12 months doing a series of events through uh, probably Kentucky, East Tennessee, Georgia, North and South Carolina. Um, obviously, Carrie, I'll send this stuff to you because I know you'll want to do this in Mississippi and mm-hmm. Arkansas and West Tennessee. So yeah. Yeah. So this just kind of got the creative juices flowing a little bit. So I really appreciate, oh, stinking A, I forgot one Sam just brought up because that's a key real estate real estate, estate. Yeah. you know that's something I you know I actually I'm thinking so much about what you were saying Sam because I think that um now's the time right to strike with irons hot on that and I think now's the time to start pulling something I mean that would probably be the one place that I would lead with because that that market goes like this. You want to get on the, the up climb of that and, and we should start addressing that. I mean, to me, that'd be one of the first ones to really look at. Yep. Because there's so many different components of that, right? So it's how to handle your own real estate, whether it's dental practice or whatnot, how to buy other real estate. Where's there the market? What's, and, and not to be distracted 
but rather to look at as an investment, what goes into that, that kind of thing. So there's, there's that conversation is something that has a lot of relevance, I guess my thought is right now. Yeah. No, it's actually, uh, we talked about articles and so that's actually the article I'm going to work on is just, um, how to recession proof, you know, your practice and the commercial real estate and all that, I think is going to be a, a, a large impact on that or just ways to, and then culture, leadership, I mean, it all, it all factors in, um, but yeah, so I'm kind of working on, working on that currently. Nice. Right I think that that's something we can so build on because that's something that is not in my my larger scope. And I think that there is a, a lot of curiosity among my practices in that. Yeah. I, I want to, I can't wait to read it. Yeah. Awesome. And after you, after you do that article, Sam, I'm going to bring you on here. We're going to have a discussion about it. Done. <laughs> get it nuts and bolts. Awesome. <laughs> Gary, I, need to, I need to schedule one with you just to uh, actually, I think we did. We did ours on my article. That's what I thought. Yeah, we did. We did. So Sam, yeah, when you're I done put it that, on LinkedIn like, oh. and I got all, I put it on LinkedIn just because I was grateful. I was like so excited to be a part of this. Mm. And all of a sudden I got all these people popping up that I haven't talked to in forever. Like, yes. it's really neat. Very it's nice. really neat. So Sam, yeah, we're going to do the exact same thing for you. So whenever you get that article finished, let me know. Yeah. Um, and then we'll do, uh, we'll do one of these and kind of highlight, highlight the concepts and, and everything in your article. Uh, very good. Guys, I appreciate y'all spending some time with me today. I got some really good content. Um, so I'm going to get to work on uh, building some of this stuff out. Um, Super fun. Thanks for doing yeah. this. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get it to where we do this about uh, at least like once every other week or maybe a couple of times a month or something like that. Um, I just need to make sure that I'm getting because based on what I'm paying this company that distributes this stuff. You know, I want to make sure that I'm giving them the content to distribute because there's a few months where I, I'm, you know, I'm paying for distribution, but I'm not sending anything to them. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Man, I got to get to work. So uh, my my goal when I started was um, to get ahead, like do a bunch and then have like a big backlog that they could work on while I was creating new ones. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, life happens. So <laughs> I think doing the articles, you know, when Jocelyn, when you write your article, Sam, you write your article, if we can always tag it onto an article, you yep. can't get that double bang for the buck. Yep. Um, I mean, to me, I, my LinkedIn views skyrocketed for those, those two things. So I think yeah. that there's value in, in kind of tag teaming those things together. They're very good. So y'all have a great rest of your day. I enjoyed it. And then uh, I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. See y'all.